referencing a geologist wannabe. <laughs> but your history. <laughs> that, that's about right. Your history is in engineering in the mining field, correct? That's right. All right. Well, let me uh, start off by thanking Bernie. We've been trying to pull this off about two, year, two years and a week. We started talking about doing some geology classes, work 10 pieces before field trip, so you know a little bit about an area before you go out. And uh, she had a bigger idea to uh, do a, uh, a piece on general geology knowledge for rock hounds, and then uh, in the last half of the talk, I'll get into the specific four, four sites that we go to a lot and talk about how the geology relates to those four sites. So, um, I know I see a lot of faces from different field trips, and even those folks may not, uh, may not know me too well, and maybe this will help. Yes. Where's he at? I'm Gus's owner. <laughs> Nobody knows my name, but they know that I bring Gus on a lot of field trips, and he's, uh, he gets around. Is he a rock hound? What's the heck is, is he a rock hound? Uh, I'm not sure he is. He's more of a rock hound friend. He goes around, and I'm sure everybody who's on their field trips with him, when we're standing there and and uh, Dan is talking about the trip and stuff, he'll come up and if your hand's by your side, boom, he's butting your hand, so, mm -hmm. so you'll pet him. So he's, he'll be going on three here shortly, he, but uh, this was his first trip to Pine Top and uh, to a cabin that we bought recently and he discovered snow for the first time, so he was, he was having a blast. Oh, that's cute. Oh, this <laughs> Uh, as Bernie said, I'm, uh, I'm not a geologist, but I play one at the <coughs> rock club. I, uh, I really wanted to be a geologist, but when I got information from Penn State, they had an entire college offering earth science majors, and geology was one, but mining engineering was more attractive because it appeared to have more money. <laughs> so I went for the money rather than the fun. So I graduated as a mining engineer from Penn State in 1970. I, I was on a co-op program, so for the four years I was in college, I worked half-time and went to school half-time at four different salt mines. The, salt, the company I worked for had four different mines, and I said, I want to work at all four mines, one each, each of my work period. So I was in Cleveland, Detroit, New York, and uh, Louisiana, that is. And then the, uh, the company got bought out by a Dutch chemical company and things changed a lot, so I went for the job security. Coal's a lot more secure because at that time coal was being used for 80% of our electrical generation and there was more job security, so. And Bethlehem Steel had a big 600-person uh, research department and they were do, starting to do what I wanted to do after all, which was apply computers to coal mining, or to, to mining in general, and in their case, specifically coal mining. I worked there for 10 years, and then things were going downhill with that company. We started to pick up a pattern here, as soon as I worked there for very long. <laughs> <laughs> the company's going downhill anyway. I moved to Oklahoma City, worked for Kermigee Coal for another 31 years. Uh, ultimately spent 25 years at the mine in, in Wyoming mining coal. So if you need my email address and telephone number, to get in touch with me later in the car. So why, uh, why study geology? Well, at least for me, it's very interesting. I'm assuming since you're here tonight, it's at least minimally interesting to you. So why would a rock hound what, what good can that do a rock hound? Well, I believe that in the long run, it's going to help you find better rocks and minerals. If you understand the geology of the deposit, 
you'll be able to focus your efforts and your, your searching will be more efficient. For example, if you were searching for gold and you understood that gold occurs frequently in quartz, that you wouldn't be running around in areas where there was no quartz. You'd go and you'd look for the fatter the quartz seam, the better. And that's where you'd, you'd start looking for gold. Uh, also, another thing is when you find something, and Ginger brought me a whole pocket full of rocks to identify tonight, um, if, if you know some geology, and part of geology is rock and mineral identification, in fact a lot of it is, then, uh, then you'll be able to talk about what you found and uh, know something just by virtue of what the rock is what the geology probably is about. And then one thing that's kind of gotten to be a sore subject with me is uh, the misuse of uh, terminology. And it isn't so much caused by people in the club as it is you're just following what you're hearing other people say. And there, I can't believe how much misidentification goes on uh, in the materials that we go out to find and uh, for a whole different bunch of reasons. I've done some research to try to figure out why, why are we calling stuff onyx when in fact it's not onyx at all. It's more correctly called travertine, the stuff we go out to collect. And uh, I even ran some tests with acid to prove to confirm it to myself that it was uh, travertine. So, just one of one of the things that will improve is if you understand the geology and can identify rocks and minerals a little bit better. So, about the first half of my presentation, we're going to talk about general geology concepts. We'll start by learning a few definitions. And then we'll talk about the geologic time scale because that's rather important when you start to talk about geology. The first thing a geologist wants to know is how old is this deposit? That'll tell, tell a geologist an awful lot about what he, he can expect to find there. Um, and then finally, we'll talk about plate tectonics. Turns out that plate tectonics for us as Arizona rock counts is very important. Almost every single site we go to was the either direct or indirect result of plate tectonic activity in Arizona. And so we'll cover some of that. And then I'll talk about the four different deposits that we collect at and how they're affected by plate tectonics and so forth. So, Let's, let's first define what a mineral is. I was surprised back when I first took my first geology course, 19, fall of 65, we used, there was a definition of what a mineral was. And I thought certainly by now, the politics of science being what it is, the definition would have certainly changed by now. And I was shocked to find out it hasn't changed a bit. The definition of a mineral is still the same as it was in 1965. There's a whole lot of other things that have changed in geology, as there has been with a lot of sciences. But there's five characteristics of a material that it have to be met in order for something to be considered a mineral. First of all, it has to be a solid, so that excludes oil and gas. That was the, the one case, you know, now when you tell an oil and gas guy, oh, that stuff you're dealing with, that's not a mineral, that's, that's an organic compound. So don't come acting like it's a mineral. When the petroleum engineers that were in the class, the geology classes, they were just freshmen and they were jumping up and down, getting all excited. How can that be that oil and gas isn't a mineral? I thought surely by now that would have changed. It hasn't. Second of all, the material has to be natural. That's probably the least uh, 
controversial characteristic here. Um, that would eliminate things like artificial diamonds. A real diamond, that's a mineral, but the artificial diamonds that General Electric first started making back in the 60s, that's not a mineral because it's not, it's man-made, it's not natural. It's the very same material, it's all pure carbon in a very complicated, tightly bound matrix, but it's still, it's not natural, so it's not a mineral. It has to be inorganic, okay? So not only does that knock oil and gas out of the picture, it also knocks coal out, but it would also knock out some limestones because if it's, if it's made by an animal, like a clam makes a shell, that goes in the limestone, then that would be not, that would be an organic material and wouldn't qualify as a mineral. Uh, it also then has to be a crystalline material. That doesn't mean it has to be clear so that you can see through it. It simply means that it has to have a crystalline internal structure. And the case that I'll give that where you would think it would be a crystal, and it's one of the misnaming things that I'm talking about, my rock up here. Who can tell me what this stuff is? Black? Onyx. Black? Mm. Oh, not onyx. No, no, don't say onyx. No. Like obsidian. obsidian. Yes, obsidian. And what do we call it? What's another name? What? Volcanic glass. Volcanic glass. Volcanic glass. Volcanic glass. Okay, glass. Glass is not crystalline. The way that obsidian forms is it's it's a magma that cooled very rapidly. So rapidly that the crystals, the, the molecules of silica didn't have time to get together and form a crystal structure. It's just an amorphous mass of silicon dioxide molecules. They're not organized at all. So it's not a mineral? And so therefore, obsidian is not a mineral because it's not a crystal. Okay. I, I can't tell you how many times I've read about people going out to the area where we collect Apache tears and talk about Apache tears crystals. I, I, want, to cover, I want to cover my ears, it's not a crystal. Therefore, it's not, it's not a mineral. And therefore, when we collect our Apache tears in this surrounding stuff. Perlite, perlite used to be obsidian, and it, all, it got so wet it got hydrated, absorbed the moisture into its lack of structure, and it's not, a, it, because it's not, wasn't a crystal here, it's still not a crystal. So it's not a mineral either. But that, just because, just because something's not a mineral, doesn't mean it's not neat to collect or can't make a nice polish and use for gem material. It's uh, the kind of thing that only geologists care very much about. So, uh, and finally, the, the fifth characteristic is that to be a, a mineral, it has to have a fixed formula. Okay, for example, what's, what's SiO2? Silicon dioxide. Silicon dioxide, and what do we call the mineral that it occurs in most often? Quartz, sand. Yeah. If it's all ground up, it's sand, but its general category would be quartz, silicon dioxide. And silicon dioxide is a very diverse mineral. It occurs in so many different structures with so many different colors. And that's probably because it's just so common. It is the most common mineral. So, above all the others, there's more quartz out there than any, any other single mineral. So, then, if we know what a mineral is, then what's a rock? Everything else is a mixture. It's mixture of minerals, okay? Now, this definition, is probably more flexible 
certainly more flexible than the definition of a mineral. There's a lot of things, you know, we, if you look here, all the things I've disclaimed as being minerals, in my opinion, still qualify as rocks, right? If they're hard and they hurt, you drop them on your foot, right? They, they're still rocks. Uh, coal, we, I find it seemed like a billion tons of coal in my career, and I still think of that as rock. So, the, uh, to, to strictly keep the rock as being composed of minerals would not be fully correct. And in order to identify rocks, there's not, unlike minerals where there's a fixed formula, in rocks there are formulas, but usually there's, they're based on a percentage of the material of the mineral that's in it. And usually it's as a range. And the, if you've been out to the Peridot Quarry, I've got a, later on, almost to the end, I've got a really nice video that talks about all the different rocks we've collected out there. And they'll identify, based on the percentage of the different minerals in it, what, what we would, should call the rocks, or what geologists would call the rocks. So, lots of different kinds of rocks. We'll talk in a second about the three main classifications of rocks, but examples are granite. Granite has a pretty clear definition. It's quartz, feldspar, and mica, but it has a pretty wide range of percentages for those three minerals. Shale, sandstones, marble, uh, and agates. Agates are, although they're largely silicon dioxide, uh, there's some characteristics of agates that uh, make differentiate between agate, jasper, and chalcedony. And I probably won't talk too much about that in tonight's talk. But three types of rocks. Anybody have any, any uh, experience with this when, in high school? Did you t have a geology class or at least some part of high school science or grade school science that talked about this? This is pretty, pretty basic stuff. Uh, three main classifications of rock, and it relates to how they're formed. Uh, igneous rocks are caused by heat. Examples are granite and basalts. Um, usually, we can identify igneous rocks uh, because they they would have the largest crystals. Here's a chunk of granite from Vermont. Um, it's a really high grade granite. They make tombstones out of it. If you've ever heard of Rock of Ages, tombstones, it's a real, it's a fine grain. So when I just got done saying it's large crystals. Well, relative to other types of rocks, sedimentary rocks and so forth, these have relative igneous rocks have relatively large crystals. Um, and, it, and they're largely formed by magma coming up from deep in the earth. We're going to talk about that aspect a lot. Sedimentary rocks, sandstones and shales, um, limestones are sedimentary rocks, and so is salt. Uh, I threw salt in there. Has anybody ever gone up to the salt mine up at Camp Verde? That's an interesting place. I just I made my own field trip up there about two weeks ago. And that I found out later that salt mine is over 2,000 years old. And it is an interesting place. Interesting because of its history, but also interesting because of the associated minerals with that deposit. You find a lot of interesting things, yes? Is it is the salt and the chemical that stays the same. Yes. So isn't it a mineral and not a rock? Salt, the, the mineral halite. Okay. Okay. Uh, sodium chloride, one sodium, one chloride molecule or atom to make a molecule. Yes, it's a mineral. Okay. And well therefore, a pure chunk of halite. It also you know, could be a rock so be a as well. Yeah. But 
It's also in this class of special sedimentary rocks called evaporites. Okay, what that means is it was a pool of water that had a lot of minerals in it, a lot of sodium, a lot of chlorine, and when it got very hot and dried up, it deposited a, a seam of salt at the bottom of that lake. And, and so that's been mined by, largely by hand, obviously, through the first 1900 years. And then in the middle of the last uh, century, there were some commercial operations that came in, but the quality of that deposit is so poor that uh, they just couldn't, couldn't spend the money, afford the money to clean it up to get it to where it was competitive in the salt market. So it got shut down. But what I read was the land, it's on, it's on privately owned land, but the landowner's fine with rock hounds going in and collecting there. So I found a lot of interesting stuff. And finally, metamorphic rocks. Metamorphic rocks could start out as sedimentary rocks or could start out as other igneous rocks. And usually because they're buried and under a lot of pressure and temperature, they get altered. The most obvious way they get altered, and I'm sure if you've paid attention driving anywhere through Arizona, you'll see rocks bent in all kinds of sort of marble cake configurations. When you see that guarantee, that's a metamorphic rock because it was, it was melted enough that when, the, when there were forces acting on that deposit, it bent all those previously flat-lying beds into some kind of a marble cake shape. So uh, quartzite, that's if quartz, if there was a quartz seam and it got uh, buried and acted upon by pressure and temperature to turn it into a quartzite. Marble is limestone that's subjected to the same conditions. And a schist could be of sandstone subjected to the, the same kinds of conditions. But somewhere in Arizona and on our travels, you can find all three of these kinds of rocks. In fact, how many people went out to Dago Springs? Okay. In that one wall where we were pounding on rocks and trying to, to find the, uh, all the nice green rocks, there were all three rocks just in, in that one area. So that kind of tells you how varied and interesting the geology is in the state of Arizona. Ah. Oh. Along on that trip, I, I happened to see along the side of the road, I think somebody almost rear-ended me because I slammed on my brakes. I had to stop and take a picture. Anybody tell me what that is? It's conglomerate. How do you know it's conglomerate as opposed to a, I say, a breccia? Breccia? Breccia is angulated? Yes. <coughs> Conglomerate looks like you look, you also can mistake it for a piece of concrete. I mean, mm -hmm. right? You have to. I have to take a second look at that. Did, it, did somebody just throw out a chunk of concrete? Conglomerate is all is the original material was river gravels and sands. Okay, so they're well rounded, right? That's how you recognize river gravels and sands. They're nice and round. So if it's round, it's probably a conglomerate. On the other hand, if the internal rocks that are now glued or partially glued back together, if they're angular and they're sharp-edged, then it's a breccia. Okay. Sedimentary rocks, how do you identify them? Well, two things. Grain size, okay, these are nice big grains. These are huge, these are sometimes almost two inches in diameter. Grain size and mineral content. What are the what are the grains made of? A lot of times quartz. Probably 90% of the time quartz because it doesn't break down very fast. And that's a very common common river gravel material. So that really didn't have a good place in there. It just 
ooh, I saw that, I was, I'd already written this, and I thought, I gotta have a picture of people on that throw in there. Okay, so, on to geologic time scale. Let me ask a, a couple questions. We'll test, we'll do a pre-instruction pre test. Uh, who can tell me how old the Earth is? Plus or minus a billion years. <laughs> About four and a half billion years. Okay, that's a long time. Uh, fortunately, as, as uh, Arizona rock has, we don't have to worry but about a tiny, tiny piece of that. Because everything that we deal with has occurred in the last 60,000 years. So, when did light first appear on Earth? Surprisingly early. I was surprised by this. About three and a half billion years. Okay, there's fossil evidence that from that far back that there were single cell algaes and slimes and you know, the early forms of life were pretty yucky. There wasn't, and there wasn't anything too interesting for billions of years. It took a long time for uh, plants to start to, to photosynthesize. And uh, when you look to see, well, how long has man been on, on Earth? It's just, it's barely worth mentioning. It's such a short period of time. So, can anybody tell me what period of time, how many years back were dinosaurs? No? About 250 million years ago to 65 million years ago. Has anybody watched any TV shows that talked about the end of the dinosaurs? Who can tell me what caused that? A meteor, yeah, where did it land? <laughs> Down on the Yucatan Peninsula, yeah. Actually, that crater is out a little bit offshore, right off the Yucatan Peninsula. And uh, what happened was the, it was such a huge meteor that it blacked out the sky and nothing grew, so there was nothing for the animals to eat. Uh, a good part, nearly all of North and South America, whatever was living there was literally fried by the heat of that impact. The rest of the world starved to death. So it, uh, it was one of the more abrupt changes in life. We went from the age of reptiles to, round of applause, ma us, mammals. It created a void in the earth and allowed mammals to uh, to thrive, it left a, left a gap, an environmental gap that mammals filled in place of reptiles. And we'll, we're gonna, I've got a video, I think that's up next. Yes, this, uh, if you read the label, it says the geomorphology of the Verde Valley. Uh, that's really irrelevant. I pulled a snippet out here where he talks about the geologic time scale and does such a nice job uh, rather than me go droning on about it I'll just uh, whoops you know what we didn't do now I remember Bernie Bernie no I gotta we gotta get into the internet anybody know the internet access no Okay, I've got a different, oh, here we go. Hold on. It's paused. Maybe it's gonna work. <clears throat> no, doesn't look like it. Hold on. If it is, I can't understand. Um, give me a five minute break because I've got this isn't the only video clip I've got, and there's three or four more. So let me hook into these are typical index fossils the geology. No. This look for to date sedimentary rocks. The geologic time during which these creatures lived is generally agreed upon. 
The sudden absence of these index fossils from the fossil record are evidence of a mass extinction event. Therefore, the presence or absence of these index fossils in a specific layer allow geologists to be able to date that sedimentary rock layer. Although life had its beginning several billion years ago as single-celled creatures, around 600 million years ago, the Earth completely froze over and is referred to as Snowball Earth. Glaciers covered the land masses and the seas turned to slush. Although there is no fossil record, it can be assumed that whatever life forms there were, they were either eliminated or perhaps only the fittest life forms survived. A thawing snowball earth ushered in the Cambrian life form explosion and the age of invertebrates, which coincidentally is when the oldest sedimentary rock formations in this area were layered down. About 439 million years ago, the age of invertebrates came to an end with a mass extinction and gave rise to the age of fishes. Then again, about 364 million years ago, another mass extinction that closed the age of fishes and gave rise to the age of amphibians. The age of amphibians came to a close 251 million years ago with the Permian extinction sometimes called the Great Gaia, when over 95% of all life forms that then existed disappeared from the rock record. The Permian extinction happened just after the Kaibab limestone formation was layered down on the rim above Oak Creek Canyon. The Permian extinction ushered in the age of reptiles, which was then interrupted at the end of the Triassic period by an extinction event most likely caused by massive floods of lava erupting from out of the earth, forming the Atlantic Ridge, which triggered the breakup of the last supercontinent, Pangaea. The last great extinction event was the famous KT extinction, 65 million years ago, which was caused by a giant asteroid smashing into the earth and ending the reign of the dinosaurs giving rise to the age of mammals. The problem with geologic time is that it is so vast, it defies our ability to comprehend it. If we talk about 100 years ago, or even 5,000 years ago, we can understand that at the time because we have human recorded history as a background to understand that at the time. But what's a million years? 10 million years? A hundred million years, let alone a billion years of Earth history. When I published my book on Sedona and the Verde Valley's geologic history, So Why Are the Rocks Red? I attempted to make geologic time comprehensible. I divided the 4.5 billion years of Earth's geologic history into a geologic calendar comprised of 12 months. Each month of that geologic calendar equals 365 million years. A day equals 12 million years. An hour, 500,000 years. And a minute, 8,000 years. The middle column represents the last 50 days in that geologic calendar. And the third column represents the final five days of that geologic calendar. Going by this geologic calendar, the basement rocks beneath us were formed August 3rd. The Tapit sandstone, the oldest known sedimentary rock in the Southwest, was formed in later November, sometime just before Thanksgiving. The red rocks of Sedona, the Schnebley Hill Formation, were formed around December 8th. The Laramide Arachid, when the southwest was uplifted over two and a half miles, happened around Christmas Eve and Christmas Day. Modern man, who's been around for about 250,000 years, has been in existence since 11.29 p.m. of New Year's Eve. And man has been in the Sedona area for about 10,000 years. 
That's only the last minute, 11.59 of New Year's Eve of our geologic calendar. Let's talk about the geologic order. Okay, that's uh... Uh, it's a lot of screen iron. The solid outermost shell of the Earth is called the lithosphere. This includes the crust and the upper solid part of the mantle. On average, it is 50 kilometers thick beneath the oceans and 70 to 100 kilometers thick under the continents. The continental lithosphere and the oceanic lithosphere also differ in composition. The continental crust floats on the asthenosphere the viscous upper part of the mantle that lies beneath the lithosphere. The movement of the lithosphere, which can be observed in a great number of places, is the reason behind earthquakes and volcanic activity. These movements do not take place randomly, but along longitudinal belts. Volcanic activity and earthquakes mostly occur at the edge of continents, oceanic island arcs, oceanic trenches, and mid-ocean ridges. These motion processes mark the boundaries of tectonic plates. The lithosphere is not uniform. It is broken up into tectonic plates of different sizes. Today, we know of seven major tectonic plates and a number of other smaller ones, which all move in relation to each other. The seven major tectonic plates are the African plate, the Eurasian Plate, the North American Plate, the South American Plate, the Pacific Plate, the Indo-Australian Plate, and the Antarctic Plate. The theory that describes the motion of the lithosphere is called plate tectonics. There are three types of tectonic movement, convergence, divergence, and subduction. Mid-ocean ridges represent an example of divergent plate boundaries. As magma, that is molten rock, rises from the asthenosphere and penetrates the oceanic lithosphere, it reaches the surface, where it cools down and solidifies, forming new lithosphere at the edge of the crack. That is how mid-ocean ridges are formed. As it expands, the mass of molten rock pulls the seafloor apart, causing the tectonic plates on either side of the ridge to move away from each other. Thus, the ocean basin grows wider, a process called seafloor spreading. That is how, for example, the Atlantic Ocean has been formed. However, since the surface of the Earth cannot increase continuously, the surface of oceans cannot increase continuously either. The opposite boundary of the oceanic plates approaches another plate. When the two tectonic plates collide, one plate moves beneath another. This is called subduction. The subducting plate moves into the asthenosphere, where it is melted and incorporated into the mantle. At subduction zones, volcanoes, fold mountains, and deep sea trenches occur. Examples of mountain ranges formed as a result of subduction are the Andes and the Himalayas. On rare occasion, Two adjacent plates slip along a fault, resulting in an earthquake. This is the case with the San Andreas Fault in California. Oceanic lithosphere is formed continuously at mid-ocean ridges and disappears at oceanic trenches. Thus, the size of plates and the location of dry land are continuously changing. down through the earth. Uh, what's the, what, anybody know okay what the radius of the earth is? How many miles? About 4,000. So from the center of the earth out to the cross about 4,000 miles. So if it's a slice of pizza, it's a big one. Um, the, this, if 
Up here, you probably can't read that label. That says continental crust. The continents that we live on are largely made of granite, and relative to the rest of the material of Earth, particularly to the core, have you ever heard that the core is iron? At the center of the Earth is a great big iron sphere. At the very center, it's solid, but if you look at that lighter colored area, that's called the outer core, it's actually liquid. And this part out here, this yellow, is the mantle. It's kind of halfway between a solid and a liquid. It's like very thick molasses. It can flow, but it does so very slowly. And what, what happens, we, I was pointing out, we need to remember what su subduction is. It's when one continent and another continent collide, one goes up, and the other, so the subducting planet go, or planet, continent goes down. That tends to raise the continents that's on top, okay, because both continents are made of granite, a low density material, and they're floating on this liquid high density material, okay? So the one that's on top gets raised. That's what happened in Northeast Arizona during the subduction period in that last 60 million years. And the plate that went down underneath the North American plate, we've always lived on the North American plate, but at that time, that's 60 million years ago, up Arizona, there was no California. Yay. <laughs> <laughs> Life was much better. Arizona had oceanfront property. Anybody remember the George Strait song about selling oceanfront property in Arizona? Well, he was just off by a few million years. There actually was oceanfront property in Arizona. And so when that plate that came across, and it wasn't the Pacific plate, there was another plate you don't hear about. You ever hear of the Farallon plate? I had never heard of it until I did my homework for this. The Farallon plate is what really caused all this Arizona geology. It subducted down under the North American plate, and it went so far down that it completely dissolved into the mantle. So it is no more. That's why you don't hear much discussion about it. It was a historical plate that just dissolved. Now, what happens during all this subduction? Well, imagine it. Two layers of rock, many, many miles thick, are scrubbing against once another, one another. Huge amount of friction, and therefore a huge amount of heat, and high pressures. And under high pressure and high heat, what ha what's formed? Diamonds. Yeah, well, diamonds, <laughs> yeah. Not, not, in this, not in this particular, well, it can, but not in this particular case, magma. That Farallon plate turned to liquid magma, okay? It's low density, and so what's it want to do? It wants to float up to the surface, and it did. It, it searched around and found cracks in the edge of the North American plate, Arizona, and came up out on the surface in the form of what? Volcanoes. Volcanoes. A lot of basalt, yeah, other andesite, other volcanic rocks. Okay, in liquid form, okay? And every, almost every single place where we go to hunt rocks, either directly or indirectly, was affected by that. So, I'll talk a little bit more about how that happened and, and what the result of that volcanism was. But if I can get this started, Last time, last two times, all I did was pick up my phone and it worked. Here it goes. I think it's going to go. If you just learn to leave it alone. Okay, let me talk about what we're looking at. Depot 
ocean, light blue is shallow ocean, shallow seas, thick limestone, uh, coral reefs, and so forth. The United States, here's Arizona over here. That map is North America, is the United States, so kind of just keep your eye on the southwest corner, and that'll tell you what happened to Arizona. This is how many million years ago it was. This is the geologic age.
archaeologists love that kind of dramatic music. <laughs> okay. Big collision formation of the Himalayas, the highest mountain range in the world, pushed smack together at high, high velocity, and ultimately you'll see it turn white because it's at such high altitude. That's uh, the Tibetan Plateau. And we're almost, we're almost home. And there we are. So how far was, uh, how far south was Arizona? Almost, almost Antarctica, okay? So for simplification, let's just assume it was at the South Pole, and we're about three quarters of the way up the Earth, right? The circumference of the Earth, half of it's about 12,000 miles. We came up about three quarters of the Earth, so somewhere between 8,000 and 9,000 miles of drift in that half a billion years. So Arizona's gotten around. I mean, <laughs> it, 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 in my mind, it just looked like a, a game of bumper cars by, by the continents. It's just absolutely amazing. And oh, by the way, I went to school so long ago, my first geology class, the professor did not believe in continental drift. <laughs> Five years later, he did, yes. What was the name of that continent that collided in Arizona? The oh, the Parallon Plate? That, was, that would be F-A-R-L-O-N, the Parallon Plate. Okay. Uh, what I, thinking back, what I don't understand is he, he taught us all about the mechanisms that made continents drift, but all, all he could, it, it shows how science is kind of goofy sometimes. Uh, at that time, the original concept of continental drift was developed on the idea if you took a world map and cut out all the continents, South America and Africa fit together. And, and there were, there's many other examples of that, that the uh, geographers first came up with the idea and said, these continents must have been all together at one point. And the geologists, nah, nah, geographers are nuts. You know, continents can't move that much. You know, they're glued, they're glued to the core. Well, they're not. So five years later, I should have taken another geology class. I learned it by watching NOVA television program. And it's like, well, they never taught us that. But, so, things can change a lot in a few years in the, in the world of science. So, okay, so how far has Arizona moved? Well, it was pretty cold, now it's pretty hot again. Uh, so, somewhere between eight and 9,000 miles. So, is it still moving today? Yes, it is. Which direction? Anybody know? West. North, yeah, kind of west northwest. Yep, that's good. How fast? Hopefully not your hairs. It doesn't feel very fast, does it? <laughs> Hold your thumb up. Just it is you rule a thumb. <laughs> your thumb doesn't have anything to do with it, it's your fingernail. I really want you to pay attention to. How much does your fingernail grow in a year? About two centimeters, you know, something a little less than an inch. That's how fast North America is moving. So. Interesting. So let's see. We talked about all all of that. I want to talk about. Let's let's cover one other thing that I I've left undiscussed. If you look here's the map of Arizona. Okay. Subduction is occurring. Farallon plates scraping along the bottom of Arizona somewhere and creating huge amounts of lava. And it wants to work its way up and squirt out on the surface. And it did that. This map, I don't know how, how well you see it. I, I can't 
see it very well even on my screen. Eh, it's not real good. But here's <coughs> just to kind of look here. The three colors that are important are red, something between yellow and red, maybe an orange and a, a yellow. Those are the different ages of volcanic activity eruptions in the state of Arizona. First thing you can notice, almost the whole state, except for the Navajo Reservation up here, are almost covered with volcanic eruptions. Okay? And those occurred somewhere between, four, yellow is the furthest out is about 38 million years, say 40 million years in round figures, up to today, zero. We, it's possible we'll have some, uh, some more volcanic eruptions. What's anybody know of any place where it's likely to occur? Yellowstone? Uh, yeah, Yellowstone is a possibility, yes. It, in fact, geologists say it's overdue, but I was thinking more in Arizona. If Arizona has an eruption, where would geologists think it's likely to occur? Flagstaff, exactly. Yes, good. Okay. So, almost every, with the extent of volcanic activity, is it any wonder that all our hunting places are tied into volcanic activity? Not really. So, with that, let's, let's start talking, because it's getting late. Let's start talking about specific places where we've hunted. Uh, Saddle Mountain Fire Axe. Who went on the Saddle Mountain trip or who's ever been there? Okay, good. Three simple steps to the formation of Saddle Mountain Agates. First, volcanic eruption. Saddle Mountain itself is the core volcano that erupted. And what it spewed out, if you don't mind, I'm going to turn on, turn on the light because everybody likes to get excited about the rocks. And I want to see them better. So Saddle Mountain was the start. And it had a lot of different phases. It spewed out a lot of vesicular basalt. Okay. A lot of, a lot of holes in it. Okay. Uh, probably big, much bigger than these. These are these are kind of tiny. And uh, that kind of created the host rock for these agates. The second step was hydrothermal fluids. What are hydrothermal fluids? Break it down. Hydro. Water. Hot water. water. Thermal. Hot. Hot. Hot water from great depth, okay? Probably some water from that Farallon plate. It had water in it, and it, under the pressure and temperature, got very hot and worked its way up from the bottom of the crust, up through the crust. And at that point, probably that basalt was buried at depth. It wasn't just sitting on the surface. And hydrothermal fluids, any hot water, as you know, ladies, from your cooking class, it'll dissolve, hot water dissolves sugar a lot faster than cold water. Well, hot water also dissolves silica a lot faster than cold water. So these hydrothermal fluids got infused into this basalt, carrying with it large amounts of silica. Now when they got near the surface, what, what starts to happen? Pressures get more or less? Less pressure, higher temperature, cooler. So what starts to happen? If you have a solution of sugar water and you cool it, solidification, another word is precipitation. The this, this sugar, or in, in our case here, the silica, the quartz, precipitates out. And where it started to precipitate out on the basalt was in those little holes. Well, not so little holes, probably like one or two inch holes. And what it did was coated 
the inside of those with multiple layers. If you look at these agates, you see they look kind of kind of layered, but there's multiple layers there. And so you can, there wasn't just one huge infusion of hydrothermal fluid. One came in and kind of filled the vesicles part way, and then another one several years later, maybe millions of years later, and it just gradually built up, built up, and built up to what you have today. And it stayed in that basalt until erosion occurred, which was the third phase. And the surface of the ground eroded down and eroded away the tops or the whole body of these basalts that were volcanoes, volcano lava flows at one time. And when it did that, it broke down the basalts, which released the agates, and now the agates are laying on the surface of the ground conveniently for us to walk around and collect. So the, the origin of those agates is really dependent on two things, having a vesicular basalt to be deposited in, the host rock, but also then the hydrothermal fluids from depth coming up and depositing agates. That's why this has occurred a lot. That's why we're, so many places that we go have so many agates in them, different kinds of agates, different colors. Why are there so many different colored agates? Yeah, it, silica is not just pure as silica. There's all this other stuff, colored rocks. Iron is popular. Yeah, yeah. A lot of different minerals came up, and with each surge of hydrothermal fluid, the chemistry was slightly different. So that's why a lot of agates are banded. Those bands represent different chemicals that were also included in these hydrothermal fluids. That's why we like agates so much. In fact, to be called an agate, what, what is the requirement? It has to be banded or it's, else it's not an agate. It's a, something else. It's a jasper. It's a chalcedony. Okay. All right. So there's one down. All right. <laughs> Arizona copper deposits. Okay. We all love those, right? This is a photograph I took in 1973, the first time I ever came to Arizona. And I was very fortunate. My, one of my roommates from college had gone into mining engineering based on me giving him a sales pitch in his freshman year about how much fun it was. <laughs> and, and that came back to be very nice because I came to a convention down in Tucson and he was there. And he says, well, I'm working up at Inspiration Copper in Miami. Why don't you come up when the convention's over and I'll give you a tour. So that's what we did. And uh, this is the top bench of Inspiration Copper in 1973. It was the day before Easter, and so the mine was, mine was shut down. Uh, did somebody notice something interesting yeah. in that corner? Yeah. There's this little little thing down here. That's my ex-wife. She's very small. She's about <laughs> <laughs> You can hold her in one hand. <laughs> That's just a bad joke. Um, she's, she wasn't that tall. She was about five foot two. But that was helpful because it gives you some scale of the size of that shovel. Uh, these are the same shovels we used in the coal mine, so I know this shiv, the, the center of that shiv wheel is about 55 feet off the ground. We had a rule that said a bench can't be any higher than the top shiv, so we limited our benches to 55 feet. And we did that for, it's amazing how things get started and then they just don't change because, oh yeah, years ago somebody said no more than 55 feet. Well, one day somebody said, why are we doing that? They said, well, for safety, because if you have a, have a higher bench taller than that, it'll fail and everybody will get crushed. And so the one production manager said, well, let's try it. 
So they made a 60 foot bench, a 70 foot bench, took the bench up to, well, here. That's probably almost 100 feet high. And, and that bench isn't collapsing. We were able to go in some places in the mine up to 100 feet. Nobody ever bothered to test the assumption that we shouldn't go any higher than 55 feet. But enough talk about coal mines. Take a look at those copper oxides. Wouldn't that have been a nice place to collect? <laughs> okay, well, I didn't have to collect in the mine. My roommate, been, and this was as a rock hound, but I thought I'd died and gone to heaven. <laughs> he got permission for me to go into what they called the vault. Whenever they came across really valuable copper oxides or any other minerals that were, would be valuable specimens, they took it in and actually had a physical vault. They locked it in. And my roommate got permission for me to go in and take home anything I could carry. <laughs> it was, this was the smallest piece of the chrysocol I could find. I, I picked out pieces based on whether I could fit them in my suitcase. <laughs> I had to fly back to Philadelphia. I filled two suitcases full of, of chrysocol and other copper oxides. Just, just amazing stuff. So, it doesn't get any better than that. Uh, anyway, to get back to this photograph, I want you, to, want you to kind of keep an eye on the fact that these oxides are occurring in these sort of vertical bands. Mm -hmm. Why do you think that's happening? Most. Yep, that, that's where the, the rock is most porous because, um, let me, let me, I'm getting rid of myself. But keep that in mind, recognize that there's porous vertical parts of the deposit and less porous places. Most of the Arizona copper deposits are a porphyry type. Porphyry is a igneous rock that looks an awful lot like granite. I mean, I don't know. Can you tell the difference? I can't. This is porphyry. This is granite. The one difference you can see, if you look at this porphyry on the broken faces, what you're gonna see here, there you go. Can you see sparkly gold mm -hmm. speckles in there? Oh yes. That's chalcopyrite, mm -hmm. okay. What's the difference between chalcopyrite and ordinary pyrite? Chalca? Uh, Chalc? Alk? <laughs> Clean. Ordinary pyrite is uh -huh. iron sulfide. Okay. Okay, if there's some copper mixed in with the iron, so there's copper and iron sulfide, it's chalcopyrite. Oh. Okay. And so this, this really is the rock that the copper mines are going after. They won't find it on the top bench or maybe even the top two benches. Okay. And they want that because of the copper? Yes. Okay. Because, I mean, those, those speckles, I'll kind of pass that around and everybody can, mm -hmm. can have a look at how small that is. This piece came from the Silver Bell Mine. I got to, I got to go there in the operating pit, oh, back in April. And the cutoff grains that they're using so, got so low that, I mean, that's not a very interesting mineral specimen. That's an interesting mineral specimen. That's a chunk of chalcopyrite. Again, I gotta go back to ancient history. On one of my trips to Arizona, not that first one, on another trip, we went down to the Senorita mine, down south of Tucson. And I don't know why it had happened, but somebody, or some way, a chunk of this stuff, the size of these two cables together and about that thick, had gotten kicked off the conveyor. It was, it was solid chalcopyrite. And I had my rock hammer with me, and I went over and whacked this off. Again, I was 
face with taking it home in my suitcase. <laughs> and that thing is, that thing is heavy. Um, how can you tell the difference between regular pyrite and chalcopyrite? It, and chalcopyrite is, is a brassier color. It's more yellow color. Uh, it, it also has a characteristic that it oxidizes very quickly. I have dipped that in acid to clean it up and make it nice and bright and put it in my mineral display cabinet. And like six months later, it's that color again. So I quit doing that and just live with the tarnished, tarnished color. So that's what copper mines want is chalcopyrite. That's where the majority of their copper reserves are, in chalcopyrite in the porphyry rock. Um, they'll mine this, okay. In fact, they grind it up and dissolve it with acid, or they have floating circuits where they can extract this and turn and oxid and deoxidize it, and turn, uh, turn it back into uh, copper. Uh, just like they do with the chalcopyrite. Chalcopyrite is more of a roasting process. They roast the, the ore and it drives off the sulfur and they're left with native or with pure copper. So, all right, so basically a, cop a porphyry copper deposit is two layers of cake. It's oxides on the top, copper oxides, and the way those have formed is groundwater. Groundwater picks up oxygen, it dissolves it from the air, and drags it down, and that's how the copper oxides are formed. It's basically chalcopyrite rusted into an oxide. That's what rust is, iron oxide. This, the green minerals, Malachite, chalcopyrite, or the calc, the <laughs> chrysocolla, and the azurite are all different oxides of copper. They differ by largely how much water they've absorbed into them. It's amazing they can make the variety of colors that they have with just a little bit or a little less water. So, Um, where does the porphyry come from? Well, it comes from magma. That chalcopyrite is right in the magma. As, as that magma worked its way up, the first crystals that start to precipitate out are quartz and feldspar and a few others. And what's left are these trace minerals, the metallics. Okay, so what you're left with is a liquid that's enriched in all these valuable minerals and it works its way up to the surface. And that's why the Arizona copper deposits, I'm gonna say are so rich, that's, were so rich, because it was the last thing that precipitated out of these magma near the surface. Um, interested, rock hounds are really interested in this stuff, less so if we could go down in the mine and still find chunks of chalcopyrite like that, that'd be cool, but I'm not sure we can do that. Well, all we have available to us now are these super low grade chunks of chalcopyrite that take a microscope to look at and see the, the valuable material in it. All right, so next thing, let's talk about what? Peridot. Peridot, okay. Peridot has what I consider one of the more interesting geologies.
And it's this video that I got excited about and started to talk to Bertie about. We ought to start showing people this video about parody. <coughs> This is a shaded topographic map view. It nicely shows the extent of the lava flow. The blue line is a dirt road that leads north from State Route 70 towards the claims on Mesa. From this topographic map, a profile of the volcanic vent and lava flow can be made. Here the red line represents the position of the profile line. This image shows the relief depicted by the contour lines on the map. And finally, it is rotated down to the bottom of the slide for a more conventional view of the profile. From field observations, the different kinds of rocks can be mapped on the mesa to produce a simple geologic map. <coughs> Paragon Mesa itself consists of a type of basalt. Here it is shown in green. Beneath the basalt of the mesa is a layer of conglomerate that is shown as brown. The conglomerate lies below all areas of the lava flow. In fact, the lava flow is a protective hard cap rock that prevents the underlying rocks from weathering away. In this case, the sedimentary conglomerate represents the material of an ancient lake in the area that existed prior to the eruption. As you can see, the sedimentary conglomerate is visible all around the extremities of the lava flow. This red area represents the volcanic vent rocks. It consists of fragments of rocks that were created during the violent explosion, as well as pieces of foreign rocks brought up in great depths below the crust. It also contains large amounts of cinders created during the eruption. This view shows the volcanic vent called Paradon Hill with an elevation of 3,231 feet. It stands about 300 feet above the surrounding terrain. This view is from the dirt road just north of the highway and looking to the north. Geochemical evidence suggests an eruption date during the Pliocene epoch, some 2.5 to 5 million years ago. And analysis of the erupted rocks that make up the vent and lava flow indicate that the eruption was very explosive. This diagram shows the initial phase of the eruption of the lake shown as a blue layer. Most likely the magma that created the eruption was highly charged with gases, probably carbon dioxide and water as superheated steam were the most abundant. As the molten mass migrated towards the surface, it created fractures in the rock above it. It was along one of these fractures that the gas-charged liquid rock forced its way to the surface. In doing so, the trapped gases rapidly expanded, created an explosion that fragmented the wall rocks of its vent and spewed solid material along with excessive amounts of gases into the air as a huge blown cloud of volcanic debris. This slide shows the continuation of the eruption with a buildup of fragments that would become Paradox Hill. Clouds of rock fragments and molten bombs continue to be jettisoned during this phase of the gas-rich eruption. As the eruption continued, the gas content of the liquid rock began to decrease. This allowed a lava fountain to form. This fountain of molten rock was directed towards the north and east as responsible for the formation of the mesa. Note also the lava flow shown in red on the right side of the diagram. This is called a rootless flow in that it is not directly connected to the vent. Instead, the fountain created enough hot material that, as it accumulated, was able to flow down the natural slope of the terrain. It is in this flow that the paradigm bearing nodules are mined. After the eruption ceased and the rocks began to cool, portions of the sides of the volcano fractured and slumped into the vent. A circular fault has allowed the inner part of the vent to drop some 50 feet in places. This is the view we have of the volcano and its lava flow today. This is a view from the area north of the vent looking north across the edge of the lava flow. The vehicle in the background is on Stevie Joey's claim view is typical of the edge of the flow, the lower slope of the hill, especially the one in the foreground, shows some of the brownish lake bed sediments exposed through the accumulated pieces of basalt that have been eroded from the flow above. Again, from the north of the bed, this view shows a better distinction between the lava flow associated with the vent and the sedimentary lake beds below. This view is looking towards the south. As the volcano erupted, it carried upwards from great depths fragments of peridotite. Peridotite is an igneous rock term used to describe a rock 
that is coarse grained and rich in olive. However, the term is a family name and includes different varieties. This is a fundamental diagram that shows how ultramafic rocks like peridotite are classified. Note that the top of the diagram denotes rocks that are 100% olivine and 0% pyroxene. As you glance down to the bottom of the diagram, the percentage is reversed <coughs> and pyroxene becomes 100% and olivine is 0%. If the igneous rock in question has anywhere from 40 to 100% olivine, it can be classified as a peridotite. The remainder of the peridotite typically contains pyroxenes, calcium-rich feldspars, spinel, magnetite, dioxide, and other minerals in minor amounts. If the rock has less olivine, 0 to 40%, and is 60 to 100% pyroxene, it is classified as a peroxenite. As the name implies, it is dominated by pyroxenes and can be distinguished from peridotites by its darker color. Peridotite and peroxenite are the main divisions, but they can be further divided. For example, if the rock is nearly pure olivine, 90% or higher, it is classified as a dunite. Its location on the diagram is at the top. If the rock has less than 90% olivine, but more than 40%, it is classified as a lurzolite. The vast majority of peridotite nodules at Peridot Mesa are actually lurzolites. With less than 40% olivine and increasing amounts of pyroxenes, the rock is classified as an olivine websterite. Finally, with 10% or less olivine and at least 90% pyroxenes, the rock is considered to be a websterite. Websterite is named after the town of Webster in North Carolina, where this type of rock was first scientifically studied. So, armed with a basic knowledge of the ultimate rock classification, the previous rock can be seen to contain at least three different coarse-grained nodules. They are peridotite, variety lurzolite, peridotite, variety dunite, peroxidite, variety olivine, websterite. This is because this particular nodule has greater than 10% olivine. And the matrix rock is the same of the variety bassinite. Bassinite is a type of salt that is very poor in silica, although the percentage of silica in this chemically analyzed bassinite is 46%. It is considered to be very low in silica. The percentage of oxides is shown in decreasing amounts. The first emphasis of this picture is the basalt. The abundant holes are called vesicles and are created by bubbles of gas within the lava that were frozen in place as the lava cooled and crystallized. The great number of vesicles lend their name to this variety of basalt, vesicular basalt. <laughs> Their abundance implies the explosive nature of the eruption. The higher the gas content of the liquid rock, the more violent the volcanic eruption is likely to be. The gases in modern volcanic eruptions are dominant. <clears throat> okay. All right. So, I think that's pretty cool. <laughs> that. <laughs> How the stuff. Okay, now you remembered all those rock and mineral things, right? right. Yeah. That's important. It's going to be on the quiz. Does that seem unnecessarily complicated? Yeah. It did to me. Rock identification. I, that was my worst subject when it came to uh, geology. I hated rock identification. But anyway, yeah, those green chunks of peridot were on the walls 60 miles down in the earth at the top of the mantle, well below the bottom of the, this granitic crust. And the, the, this eruption was so violent that it ripped huge chunks of that material off the walls of this pipe, this conduit that carried the basaltic lava to the surface. And it came up all mixed in, not broke, well, kind of broken up. I think my theory is that the reason that this is all broken up was thermal shock. It probably started out with beautiful, large peridot crystals at depth. And then it wasn't all broken up by the time it got to the surface. By the time it flew through the air <laughs> and then rolled down the hill, it probably was. But... Uh, I, th I think that's 
I enjoyed the geology of this more than almost more than I enjoyed collecting <laughs> the peridot out there. Uh, that last trip, somebody, and I can't remember who it was, asked me, well, well what's all this brown sparkly stuff? If, if this is peridot, what's this? What's the brown? Well, I think I misidentified it. After I rewatched this, I decided that, that brown is Websterite. It's the really low olivine content, almost zero olivine, and that's why it's not green, and it's brown instead. And I specifically picked that up just for that reason, so I had a chunk that showed both, both different kinds of material. That rock he had was really good. He had like five or six different kinds of, of rocks in one big boulder. That's probably true. That boulder I took a picture of you sitting on probably probably is one of those really nice boulders to have. Anyway, I won't pass these around, but feel free to come up and have a look if you don't know where to have a look at some of this stuff. But that's that's the most direct volcanic material. All, obviously, it's all igneous rock. And last but not least, let's talk about perlite and Apache tears. Okay, and I'll try to try to get through this quickly. This is not a photograph that uh, in, was taken in Arizona. It was taken in Oregon. And what it is is it's a lava flow, but it's an unusual lava flow. It's probably a hundred foot thick. And it's largely, not pure, I'd say probably 95% obsidian. It's a volcanic glass flow. Magma to cool, once again, so quickly it didn't have time to crystallize. And so it's great massive gobs of, uh, of obsidian, beautiful volcanic glass. Not particularly high quality. When I first went there in mid-70s, this uh, lava flow was controlled by the highway department, and they didn't care if you carried it away. So once again, <laughs> once again, I filled my suitcase, and to this day, I still have chunks of obsidian in my backyard. They made the full circle, airplane ride to Philadelphia, and then Wyoming, and finally back to, well, not to Oregon, but down to Arizona in my flower beds. But I went back recently in the last five years, and that's been turned over to the BLM. And they ruined all the fun. Uh, obviously, you, you know, you're allowed to climb up on it, but thou shalt not walk away with any of those rocks. So they have a sign about the curse. And, you know. Yeah, oh yeah. That's why I worry about having bad luck. <laughs> I, I can't imagine, even if people filled their suitcases and hauled it off, if, if people were reasonable about it, I don't see why like, carrying off a hand sample of that volcanic glass would have any impact. But in any case, that's the sad situation today for us rock hounds up there. Uh, there's another place, though. You don't have to limit your collecting to that particular lava flow, there's a butte out there in Oregon called Glass Butte. You have to do a little more digging, but you can, but it basically is a, a obsidian lava flow. It's buried under a lot of dirt, so you've got to do a little digging. But you can, you can find a variety of chunks of obsidian there, so it's worth going. I never, I never went there, but someday I'll get there. Okay, so. That's how the uh, perlite deposit, where we go to collect uh, Apache tears, started. It started with an eruption followed by rapid cooling and therefore an obsidian flow. But that obsidian flow was subsequently buried, probably just by more layers of volcanic ash and other volcanic materials piling on top of it. Um, maybe other material flowing down from above uh, Superior, those mountains that are up there, whatever they're called, uh, probably added some sediment to the burial. And once again, 
we get a we get an infusion of hyd hydrothermal fluids up through cracks and fissures in the obsidian, and that was it was so hot and so much of it that the obsidian started absorbing, getting hydrated, and turning it from pure obsidian volcanic glass into pearly. Okay. And the, the good news is the hydration didn't get all the way through. It's kind of funny that it stopped where it did. You know, these aren't, well, these aren't the biggest Apache tears you'll find there. But in fact, they're kind of smaller ones. But uh, it's interesting that the hydration stopped where it did. And it left these, these blocks were probably more rectangular blocks. The fractures were more straight planes, but by the time it, the water worked its way in, 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 the circle that was left unhydrated was circular. So the patchy tears aren't square, they're round, they're, you know, approximately round. So that's how that formed. So two or three steps away from direct lava flow, and once again, we've got volcanic activity creating minerals and rocks that we're interested in collecting. And as best I could tell, I couldn't find any documentation on perlite to tell when, how old is it, when did that volcanic flow actually occur. But, but maybe with some more work I could find that. So, anyway, Apache Tears are the unaltered obsidian spheres that are still left on the inside. So with that, I will uh, wish you happy rock hounding, but uh, let me mention a couple resources you might like to know about. All of these videos that I couldn't get to run very well came from YouTube. I watch a lot of YouTube and to create my own little internet university and th there's an amazing amount of uh, rock hounding on there and one of which uh, there's a young lady who lives in Flagstaff and she fin primarily hunts in Arizona and uh, I don't know what her I don't have a clue what her name is in spite of my best efforts I couldn't find apparently there's some practice on YouTube where in order to keep the weirdos from coming to your, her door, she, she doesn't give her name, but she goes by rocks for brains. So if, uh, if you wanna, if you, rocks for brains. So if you just go on YouTube and Google rocks for brains, all the field trips, and she probably has a good dozen field trips out there that she's going on and She's not, very, she, she's not very detailed about disclosing where she is, but if you, but I keep my little rock collecting books for Arizona, rock hounding books right beside me. And when I'm watching them, I'm flipping through to see, <laughs> well, what, where could that possibly be? And I've been able, within the duration of the first viewing, able to figure out where she's at. That's how I discovered the places out at uh, Saddle Mountain. She went there. So anyway, that's an interesting site, something you might enjoy, if, give it a try. There's another one, and this guy uh, goes under the name currently Rock Hounding. And man, if you ever wanted to meet a nerd in your life, this guy is the ultimate nerd. <laughs> but he is uh, extremely, he's only been rock hounding about three years, but he is a, he's just crazy for rocks and rock hounding. He lives in Spokane, Washington, and so he hasn't made it to Arizona that I can tell ever, but he covers Washington State very well. Last summer, he spent the whole summer in Utah, and, and boy, that he gave some great locations. And he will actually, if you go to his website, he'll actually give you the coordinates of the site he's at. So he's, uh, he really believes in passing on locations for rock collecting and 
being very specific about it. So I've kind of laid out a plan to really like to go to Utah and visit some of the places where he went. And he's covered the state of Idaho, too. But Utah is an amazing state for rock collecting. And you might enjoy some of, some watching some of his. The vast majority of YouTube rock hounding videos, quite frankly, give me motion sickness. <laughs> rock hounds go out, they strap on their GoPro, and they start looking, and they're doing this. <laughs> and all you see is the ground flying by, and then flying back the other way, and flying by, and then all of a sudden, oh, there's one. And the hand comes down, and they turn it all around, and then you hear it hit the bucket, and then the GoPro starts again. And I can't handle but more about two or three minutes. And most of those are real secretive about where you are. A few of them will give you coordinates. But these are two that I enjoy watching the most, and you may, you may enjoy them too. Another thing that I've done is attend old, what I call it, Old Folks University. Uh, it's an organization called OLLI, O-L-L-I, and it's hosted by ASU, and it's, sorry guys, you gotta be 50. I know most of you don't need that criteria <laughs> yet, but someday you will. And uh, it's, it's really, they call them classes, that would be a stretch. There's no exams, you know, it's just, just really lectures. And they're an hour and a half a piece. Uh, some of them are multi-session. The longest one I've ever seen is four sessions. Uh, most are one or two lectures long. The, the price is right, it's $14 a lecture. Through the pandemic, they've gone all to uh, <coughs> Zoom. All the classes have been on Zoom. They're trying to get back to in-person classes. I hope they don't. I started when the classes were all in person and the classes I wanted to take, most of them were up at ASU West, 60 miles up, and I had to drive through rush hour traffic 60 miles. Man, that was a thing. And when we went over to Zoom and I, I could sit down anywhere and watch the class, what a blessing. So anyway, on there, they, they have a wealth of subjects. And, and they don't advertise, or you, you, people just don't know it. I learned about it from a lady in Santa Fe, of all things, who lived in, she was a docent at the art museum, and she was telling me about it. I said, well, I'll have to check that out when I get home. And so I've been taking, I don't know, a dozen classes a semester ever since then. And I don't, I don't act any smarter, but I enjoy the classes anyway. But uh, one of the things that they do have, they, they have, in a given semester, they'll offer 300 different classes. And some of them are on geology. The, the problem has been, I signed up three times for Arizona geology. And, and whenever they had, whenever they cut off and said, no, no in-person classes, a geology professor said, well, then I'm not gonna do it. So three times my class got canceled. <laughs> Sooner or later, I'm gonna, have, I'm gonna get a chance, but he's not the only one teaching geology classes. There's two or three other people talking about like the geology of the Sedona area, the geology of the Grand Canyon, and those are worth watching. So you might take a look at that, that class schedule, see if there's anything you'd be interested in taking, and obviously we're all more diverse group than just rock hounding, I think. And there's many other subjects. I, I like to paint as well, so I've learned to, I've learned to paint like Monet and paint like Giorgio O'Keefe, <laughs> and really enjoyed that as well. So just, uh, just a recommendation. And I can't find any of my friends that know anything about it, and it's really worth it. It's reasonably priced. So with that, I'll ask if there's any questions to finish up the evening. And apologize for running long. It's, Eight o'clock, yes. You didn't cover turquoise. Oh, yes. Turquoise is just one of many more. I, I kind of limited my discussion to three different copper oxides. Turquoise is another copper oxide. I could have listed, 
I don't know, a couple. There's a couple hundred different copper oxides. In fact, a, uh, I was just thinking about that today. There is a copper oxide called margarita site. And I know the name of that because my first girlfriend who was, went on to stay at Penn State to get her PhD in geology, discovered it. And so she's the, she's got credit for having, this, and she named it. She, she, well, why'd you name it that? Well, I like margaritas. <laughs> and the name hadn't, and the name hadn't been used before. So, uh, she'll, uh, I'm, we've been trying to get together and I bring her on some of the, she's quite a character. Once you meet her, you won't forget her. And I uh, tried to get her to come along on some of these collecting trips. So, yes? Are the superstitions volcanic? Uh, well, yes and no. There are volcanoes within the superstition mountains, but the basic root of the superstition mountains is granite. Okay, it's essentially continental material, and the way they formed is this uh, collision between the Farallon Plate and the North American Plate. Uh, most, two-thirds of, of Arizona is, is in what I call the crumple zone. When they smash a car up and run a collision test, they call it the crumple zone, the front end of the car. And when, when a car gets crumpled, some of the metal goes down and more of it goes up than down. Well, that's what happened to Arizona. Uh, the Superstition Mountains was a chunk of continental material, granite, and it got pushed up. And so when you're driving through the superstitions, especially drive over to Globe and all that granite that you see, all those interesting shaped weathered granite rocks, that's, that's, earth, that's continental root material is what it is. And so they're igneous rocks, but they're not, they, they didn't erupt, okay? They just got solidified and pushed up by this Farallon plate collision. Anything else? Alrighty, well I hope you enjoyed it. I hope you learned something.